Goedenavond, dames en heren. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, everyone. I'm very happy that today we have such a full room uh, with audiences from Utrecht, from Amsterdam, from uh, different places all over the world to discuss the fact that we need to talk about a revolution. Is it time to have a new revolution? Do democracies need revolutions? Uh, well, at least today they seem to be under pressure. And there are cries that we need more reforms. There are groups from the left, Extinction Rebellion, the, who vote for climate change and want to reform the world on that. There are also groups from the right or even the hard right who also clamor for a kind of a revolution to upturning the elites. So if there are so many loud voices in the public arena, then historical times spring to mind. The discontent with the politics on the street, it looks like echoes from the past. Some might think the French Revolution is imminent, but a comparison with the revolution of 1848 is perhaps the most apt and relevant revolution. Chris Clark, in his masterful book, Sir Christopher Clark, in his masterful book, 1848, also reminds us of the attacks on Capitol Hill on 6 January 2021 that was filled of echoes of theatrical mobs running against the parliament, something that also happened in 1848. So we will have a discussion on that, but first let me introduce the speaker of tonight and the people who will respond to this. My name is Beatrice de Graaf, I'm Distinguished Professor at Utrecht University and I'm also a member here of the Royal Netherlands uh, Academy and I'm also part of the historic chamber of this uh, Royal Netherlands Academy and Judith Polman, who also supports uh, Professor Polman this evening tonight, is here as well. Uh, the speaker of tonight is Sir Christopher Clark. He's Regis Professor of History at Cambridge University. He received widely critically acclaim for his book on the Prussian history uh, of Iron Kingdom, the rise and downfall of Prussia. He received many prizes for that and even more for his study on the outbreak of World War I, the sleepwalkers, how Europe went to war in 1914. And he discussed it with almost all presidents and chancellors in Europe, including Angela Merkel. Um, he joins us today to discuss his new book, Revolutionary Spring, Fighting for a New World, 1848 till 1849. And he will give the keynote tonight. And then after that, we have two responses. First response by Professor Annelien de Dijn. She's Professor of Modern Political History at Utrecht University. And her research focuses on the interaction of politics and ideas in the modern world. Her latest book, Freedom, an Unruly History, about the history of the concept of freedom, came out in 2020 and was honored with the Prose Award for Philosophy. And then we have a third speaker who unfortunately couldn't be here tonight because of um, confusion in air traffic, because of the NATO uh, practices uh, on our continent and strikes in Italy. So she'll join us online. She's professor of international history and capitalism at European University Institute in Florence. She's also professor of international history at the University of Sydney. And Glenda Sluga received the European Research Council advanced grant for her work um, and she published a book on the invention of international order in 2021, remaking Europe after Napoleon. So I think that's enough said about the speakers now, and I would like to start with Chris Clark. Please join us, and uh, you have the floor. A warm welcome for Chris. Thank you, Beatrice. Thank you. <clears throat> Dames en heren, het is een uh, grote eer om, uh, om hier te zijn bij de Koninklijke Nederlandse Academie van Wetenschappen. Nederland was misschien uh, niet een van de meest beroemde uh, schouwtonelen van revolutie in het jaar 1880, uh, 1848. Toch waren de gevolgen ook hier diepgaand. Wel nu, hiermee heb ik mijn hele Nederlandse woordenschat uh, opgebruikt. <lacht> Uh, nu zal ik uh, verder gaan in het Engels. 
It's a tremendous pleasure to be part of an, an event that involves uh, Beatrice de Graaf, Annaline de Dane, and Glenda Sluga. Uh, these are three colleagues who, in, in, from different angles and in different ways, have all been transforming our understanding of the 19th century. Um, Beatrice, through her, in, in particular through her recent book, Taken de Terreur, which is about what happened after 1815, the emergence of new security um, cultures in, in Europe. Uh, Annaline de Dane, through her bold new uh, discussion of liberty, of freedom, and the ways and the and the sort of mutations of the idea of freedom, in particular in the 19th century, where she sees a key turning point. And Glenda Sluger, in her recent study, though there are other ones as well uh, that she's written, Inventing International Order, which is also about the first half of the 19th century and how ideas of what international order is change or are invented anew in this period. But now to come to the subject of my talk. In their combination of intensity and geographical extent, the 1848 revolutions, hang on, there's my title slide, where has it gone now? Oh, here we are, there we are, that's the title slide. In their combination of intensity and geographical extent, the 1848 revolutions were unique, at least in European history. Neither the great French Revolution of 1789, which is called the French Revolution for a reason, uh, nor the July Revolution of 1830, uh, though there was a certain amount of cascading uh, in 1830-31, nor the Paris Commune of 1871, nor the Russian revolutions of 1905 or the twin revolutions of 1917 sparked a comparable cascade of transcontinental tumults. 1989 looks like a better comparator, but there is still controversy as to whether these uprisings can be characterized as revolutions. And in any case, their direct impact was largely limited to the Warsaw Pact states, or the formerly Warsaw Pact states. By 1848, in contrast, parallel political tumults broke out across the entire continent, from Switzerland and Portugal to Wallachia and Moldavia, from Norway, Denmark and Sweden to Palermo and the Ionian Islands. This was the only truly European revolution that there has ever been. But it was also, in some respects, a global upheaval, or at least it was an upheaval, uh, a European upheaval with a global dimension. The news of revolution in Paris had a profound impact on the French Caribbean. Because one of the first things that the uh, new government did in Paris was to issue an abolition, a decree, or announce the, uh, the issuance of a decree abolishing slavery throughout the entire French Empire. And that included, of course, the Sugar Islands, on which a particularly brutal form of slavery prevailed, uh, of Guadeloupe, Martinique, Réunion, but also the French bridgeheads on the Senegalese coast, Algeria, and many other locations. In all of these places, the um, ab abolition decree went immediately into effect. And we see one of its consequences was the, present of the presence of the first men of colour to take part in uh, a Parisian, uh, in a national, French National Assembly. This man, he, Victor Mazulim, who served as, an, as a deputy in the uh, Assemblée Nationale Constituante, or here, his, he was from Martinique, or here, his colleague, Louisie Mathieu, seen here with his colleagues of the Montagne, which was, as in the first French Revolution, the name given to the deputies of the left. In the young nations of Latin America, too, the European revolutions galvanized liberal and radical political elites, creating new chains of arguments and discussions, and also the foundation of new clubs and associations. Even in far off Australia, the February revolution created political waves, though it was not until the 19th of June, Australia, by the way, is where I came from, I grew up in, come from, uh, come from, I grew up in Sydney, um, but it was not until the 19th of June, 1848, that the news of the February events reached Sydney in the colony of New South Wales, a reminder of what the Australian historian Geoffrey Blaney once mournfully described as the tyranny of distance. These revolutions were experienced, and this is an important point and something I try and bring across in the book, as European upheavals. The evidence for this is superabundant. But they were nationalized in retrospect. The historians and memory managers of the European nations absorbed them into specific national teleologies and path dependencies. And this has meant that while there are many, many brilliant studies of 1848 in particular regions, in countries or cities, synoptic studies of the revolutions are far rarer. 
So in writing this book, I wanted to join them up, to think about them in the European frame that it seemed to me was proper to the European horizons of those who experienced them. So what I wanted to do with the time I have this evening is to say a few words about what I was trying to achieve in this book. The first idea was to get away from a diffusionist model in which the revolutions cascade outwards from Paris. Captured in Metternich's famous remark, um, Paris, catches, uh, sorry, Paris sneezes, the rest of the uh, continent catches a cold. This was not the case in 1848. If you look at the press, the horizons of reporting were already emphatically European before the revolutions had even broken out. Already in 1847, news was spreading across Europe of the events in Switzerland, where a major civil war had broken out. Here we see the two parties in that civil war, the Sonderbund and the, um, and its, and the liberal cantons, who fought a civil war with each other. And here we see um, a typical scene from this, uh, the war, very, it was a very Swiss civil war. Not very many people were killed, only 100. Um, it was a sort of model railway sized civil war. Uh, and here you can see a typical scenery with sort of postcard, postcard uh, in imagery in the background and soldiers crossing a bridge. But it was deadly enough. I mean, 100 people killed is already a tragedy, obviously. And the liberal cantons were victorious. And the news of this liberal revolutionary success was greeted throughout Europe with uh, whooping of delight. Right across in France, you can see the banqueting movement that spreads in France begins to take up the cause of la liberté suisse. It's discussed in the Italian press, even in the Wallachian press, in far off Bucharest and in uh, Transylvania and the Romanian language press of the Transylvanian parts of, the hung of Hungary, which is in the Austrian Empire. In all these places, the Swiss question is discussed with great excitement and earnestness. And then comes the news from Sicily, from Palermo, from Naples. On the 29th of January, 1848, Alexis de Tocqueville stands up in the French Parliament and says, you know, don't for one moment think that these storms on the horizon are going to stay on the horizon. They are coming to Paris. They will soon be in the streets in front of our windows. Nobody believes him on that occasion, but a couple of weeks later it becomes clear that he was right. He's the only person who predicts this mobility of the revolution. But everybody agrees that this is a connected tumult, that this is not a continent with siloed, separated, dynastic and national entities. It is a connected society. An editorial of the journal La Réforme, which we see here. Uh, hang on, got to make this move. There we are. Of La Réforme announces shortly before the revolution breaks out, it, it announces that it's nonsense to speak of Europe as consisting in some parts of, of advanced countries that are ripe for a political upheaval and in other parts of backward countries that are going to have to wait centuries before revolution arrives. They say, no, we all want the same things. The problems that gnaw at the entrails of Germany are the problems that gnaw at the entrails of France, of Spain, of every other European state. And of course, we know that in one of the most famous uh, diagnoses of the revolutionary phenomenon, the Communist Manifesto, penned by Marx and Engels, that they referred not to a, 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 an, an Gespenst geht in Europa um, or geht um in Europa. It was not a, a spectre haunting you know, Germany or Italy or the, back or the, or the more uh, regressively governed states. It was a spectre haunting the whole of Europe. It might seem obvious that leftist intellectuals would think of Europe as a joined up society, but even in liberal and conservative newspapers, we find the same intimations of the connectedness of Europe, the same broad European horizons. In uh, there's Tocqueville and he's making his prediction, or he's not doing it there, but there's a piece from the thing. And there's the, Curi the, the Curiero Romanesque, um, a, a Romanian language paper published in Bucharest, which made exactly the same observations about the troubles in Switzerland, in southern Italy, and so on, and said, you know, the peoples of Europe are rising, get ready. And we find the same kind of European horizons in this book here, the Gazeta di Transylvania, another Romanian paper, Romanian language paper, but this time from inside the Kingdom of Hungary. And in this one here, in far off uh, Finland, in Helsinki, Suometar, um, likewise reported on the disturbances in the rest of Europe, um, admittedly with a certain time delay that took a while for the news to get into the Russian Empire and all the way down to the, uh, to the Finnish, du the, Duchy of, uh, the Grand Duchy of Finland, but nevertheless it eventually 
made it there, and the editorial writers of Suometar made no bones about the fact that they sympathized with this revolutionary movement across the, uh, across the continent and that, and that they regarded it as a single connected phenomenon. So a second, that was one objective, to bring out the connected, the European connectivity of this um, revolution. A second objective was to expose the special quality of revolution as experience. Virtually all of the testimony that we have refers to the intensity of revolution as an experience of mobilization, of immersion in a collective self. I'm thinking here of the radical Berlin law student Wilhelm Berner, who reports in his memoirs, written just a couple of years after the revolution, he says, I was in such a state of animation, of excitement, that, and my heart was thudding so hard in my chest that I feared that it would blow a hole in my ribs. And he said, so in the end, I couldn't stay in my rooms. I had to get out onto the streets. And when I got out, got out onto the streets, I felt I could hear the hearts of everyone else beating too. And this sense of connectedness with other people, embracing strangers, this is something strangers embrace each other all across Europe. And this is remarked upon people of very different social status, weeping in each other's arms in the euphoria, this moment of extraordinary upheaval and, uh, and dis inhibition which happens in the spring days of uh, the revolutions in Europe. Or you think of Fanny Lewald, um, the Berlin-based writer and memoirist, commenting on her experiences in Paris, where she said it was the constant singing. The singing never stopped. Um, the energy was so intense, one witness in Buda and Pesh, the twin cities, the twin capital cities, if you like, of the, of the Kingdom of Hungary. One witness in Buda and Pest reported that the energy in the city was so intense that he wondered that the Danube River didn't rise up out of its banks and join in the, in the celebrations. <laughs> the light seemed different. A lot of people comment on that. They said it seemed as if the light was brighter. They said people seemed taller. They seemed taller than they had been before the revolution broke out. They seemed to walk and even to laugh differently. There was a subsiding or a falling away of fear that's also widely discussed. It, you realize, although this is not something that's often articulated, that people were afraid of the troops who were ubiquitous in the European cities. They could be seen guarding all the public buildings. That fear suddenly falls away and you have a phenomenon referred to by the Italian uh, revolutionary who later wrote a memoir of his experiences, Michitelli, who refers to uno squilibrio di due paure, a, a disequilibrium, an imbalance of two fears. They their fear of us was growing while our fear of them was dwindling. And revolutionary behaviors, revolutionary situations, sorry, called for special kinds of behavior. Most people had never been in a revolution before. They were thrust into completely unexpected situations. And there's a marvelous description by one young radical in Berlin of having to, he sees there's a, a crowd of artisans and so on standing in, the, in an area called Die Zelten, uh, on the edges of, of central Berlin, and there are radicals giving speeches. And he says, you know, I, 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 he feels he'd dearly like to go up and join them and give a speech himself. And a man says, and he, he, he raises his hand and says, can I come up? And the man beckons him up onto the stage and says, come on, young man, you give it a try. So he stands there and he He's, he's trying to get going, but he's so nervous. He said he feels as if a, a, a wire or a shoelace has been tightened around his throat. He can't make his voice sound. And he's, he looks at this dark mass of people who, who've all gone silent waiting for him to speak. And he says, the terror is just too much. And then after a while, they start saying, boring. And then the man says, you better go down, young man. So you go, you know, good try and try it again later. So he, he goes down and he joins the crowd again. And a moment later, or a little while later, half an hour later, he's heard a couple of not very good speeches. So he tries to come up again. And he's, the, the man says, OK, give it another try. And he starts by saying, 33 years of servitude. And there's an enormous roar of applause. He's referring to the 33 years since 1815, the Vienna settlement. Years of servitude. This goes down well with the radical audience. They like this idea. And then he says, he's thinking to himself, he wants to get across the idea that rather than simply copying what's happen in, happening in Paris, that the Berliners, the Germans, should make their own revolution. So then he says, let's not be slavish imitators of the revolution in Paris. And this is immediately misunderstood. And they think he's arguing against the revolution. And there's this, boo, get him off the stage. And the, um, the man says, I'm sorry, you're going to have to leave again. <laughs> it's not working out. So in any case, the point is people had to discover that they had a voice or they had to discover that they didn't 
have a voice. People had to learn new skills. They had to perform, often in highly theatrical situations, and stage fright and stage failure was part of that story. And it's very widely remarked on in the memoirs of those, both people talking about themselves and also talking about the appalling rhetoric of, you know, not so successful revolutionary performers. So that was something else. I wanted to, you know, expose the texture of experience of revolution, which for everybody who lived through it was a, a memory that marked them for life. I mean, they, people never forgot what it was like to be in this situation. A third point, I wanted to integrate those countries that supposedly escaped revolution. There's a sort of powerful discourse in older studies of 1848 that there were the countries that needed a revolution because they had nasty old monarchs like Prussia or the Habsburg monarchy, the, the Austrian Empire. And then there were relatively liberal countries like ne the Netherlands or Belgium or Britain, which didn't need a revolution because they were already so liberal. This is, was a very popular view in Britain, where the Times, even at the Times, uh, the, the Times newspaper said, well, of course, we're not going to have a revolution here because our people already have everything they want. And of course, we've got the Chartist movement, but your Chartist is not a red-eyed madman of the continental type. Uh, he'd rather, this is, I'm quoting here, he'd rather go home and have tea with his wife than set fire to another chap's house. <laughs> so that's the, the kind of argument people are making. But in fact, we know that in the Netherlands, for example, all of the conditions were satisfied on the eve of 1848 for the unleashing of a rebellion, even in this country. A hungry population, an increasingly radical middle class, and here too there were processions and demonstrations that demanded lower taxes, cheaper food, and more democracy, just as they were throughout the rest of the continent. And here it was this, the monarch's sudden decision, under duress and in highly irregular conditions, to concede the formation of a committee for revision of the constitution that helped to deflect an upheaval. And the man, Wilhelm Willem II, Willem II, appointed to do this, to head this committee, was none other than jo Johann Rudolf Torbecke, who shepherded the introduction of constitutional and other reforms, including some social reforms, that diffused the mood of discontent brewing in the country. And something similar happened in the Kingdom of Belgium under the supervision of Charles Rogier. Do I have him? Yes, I do. Who is the sort of Belgian counterpart of Torbecker? This is an important point for anyone working in the Anglophone tradition. Because as I say, in Britain, historians working in the Whig history tradition uh, tended to explain the absence of a major upheaval on the British mainland as the consequences of the extraordinary liberality of British institutions. But it was a much more complicated story than that. Part of the reason why Britain didn't experience a major upheaval on, the, on, on its mainland was that Britain was exceptionally intensely policed. And this is something that the Prussians understood very well. And in the summer of 1848, they sent a fact-finding party to London, which asked particularly to be taken to Ireland and to be shown how the Irish constabulary, an extremely fierce paramilitary constabulary, which was always pouncing on anything that looked like an Irish, uh, some, anything remotely seditious in Ireland, they wanted to understand how the British pulled this off, how they organised their police force. And in fact, they took back many ideas and used them to strengthen policing in Prussia itself. So that was part of the argument. Part of the answer as well was that the British succeeded in outsourcing revolutionary tumult by picking people out, especially in Ireland, but also in England, and transporting them to places like Australia or South Africa. And in fact, the Sydney Morning Herald was quite clear about this. They, when they wrote a big editorial late in the year 1848, and they said, why is it that things have become so bloody and violent in Paris? They were referring to the June days of the revolution in the summer of 1848 in Paris, whereas things have remained calm in the motherland. And they said, well, the reason is that the English can, of course, always remove their misfits and farm them out to the colonial periphery, which means here. Uh, we get all the troublemakers. That was the argument. So it's a much more complex story than simply liberal institutions. And when the British faced a revolution themselves on the Ionian Islands, where they were the protectors, they held a high commission, a high commissionate, or whatever it is exactly, it was a protectorate of the Ionian Islands run by the British. When they encountered there a sort of violent revolution on the, on the island of Kefalonia in 1849, of the kind that many other regimes faced in Europe, they responded in exactly as violent a manner as the Austrians did 
to the Hungarian Revolution. There were numerous floggings, over 300 floggings with the cat and nine tails, a punishment people on Kefalonia had never seen before, and which reminded them of the worst excesses of Ottoman rule. The, so there was, there was that, but there were also numerous hangings and shootings. There was the burning down of crops and the destruction of houses, um, completely illegal rampaging by British troops, often accompanied by the High Commissioner himself, who was famous for running up to, co to cottages where suspects supposedly lived or their families and kicking down the doors. So the British behaved more or less as everybody else did when they faced a revolution on their own turf. And I think integrating these cases, the cases of the dogs that didn't bark, to borrow from Conan Doyle's, uh, the title of one of his short stories, um, underscores the genuinely European scale of these events and is a check at the same time. It's a check to liberal condescension. I also wanted to capture the polyvocality of these uh, revolutions. They were garrulous. They were very, very communicative. It's astonishing how many of the participants in the revolution of 1848 wrote books about their own experiences. These books were sometimes quite substantial books, 400, 500 pages with footnotes and tables, all sorts of information. There's Emile Thomas, who ran the Atelier National, the national workshops for unemployed men in Paris, wrote a massive history of the, Atel of the Atelier National about a month or two after they were closed down. I mean, I don't know where he found the time before an era of personal commute computing to do this. There's an even more striking case of a book called Le Ultime Giornate degli Austriaci a Milano, which was written five days after the Austrians were driven out of Milan. This book apparently took five days to write. I mean, when you actually read the book, which I have, one is less impressed when one reads it. Um, in fact, I began thinking, well, how come it took him a whole five days to write this? But anyway, nevertheless, people were very quick to hurry into print. And they could do that because they had a highly historicized understanding of what was going on, because they knew this was not the first revolution. They all had the images and the narrative, scraps of the narrative of the great French Revolution of 1789 into the 1790s, playing at the backs of their heads like old movies. So they didn't read this revolution as just a sort of, you know, bolt out of the, out of the blue. They read it as history in the present, the unfolding of history in now, in the now, as it were, history had moved from the past into the present, and you could watch it, and one was constantly comparing what was happening in 1848 with the previous revolutions, 1830, but in particular the French uh, original. So you have these many, many voices that we can listen to when we get near these revolutions. But this multitude of voices also, of course, helps to explain it's the richness of the revolution, its intellectual richness, its emotional intensity. But it's also where we find the, co the key to the fragility of these revolutionary fronts. Because we see very quickly how this multitude of voices produces fine cracks, which like the cracks in the surface of paint, which spread across the revolutionary fronts you see a loss of cohesion and a dispersal of effort. It turned out that those who saw themselves as taking part in these revolutions did not agree on what the revolution should be used to achieve. It's a little bit like the, the Tahrir Square moment in Egypt in, eight, in 2011. Initially, it looked like the whole of Egyptian society was there. It didn't take very long be before it became clear that it was a lot more complex than that. And Fanny Lewald is a fascinating witness to this process by which even those new elites, liberal ministers who've been brought into government because of the revolution or the provisional government in France, the way in which they cease to use the word revolution by the summer of 1848, they're getting embarrassed by the revolution which put them into power. Um, and they start to use instead words like les événements, die Ereignisse, die Vorkommnisse, um, and so on. These deep and ubiquitous forms of disagreement across the revolutionary front were possible because these revolutions were not made by revolutionaries. That's one of the core arguments of the book. We think of revolutions as events made by people that we call revolutionaries. But perhaps there's never been a revolution that actually follows that recipe. Certainly the 1848 revolutions did not. It was not revolutionaries who made the revolution. It was the other way around. The revolutions made revolutionaries. The revolutionaries were those who found themselves after the revolutions that occurred in a position to inherit the, the, the shattered sovereignty, the vagabond sovereignty created by the upheaval of the spring of 1848. But what that meant was that there were no plans, no roadmaps. The people who 
we think of as revolutionaries were as confused and surprised by the revolutions. In fact, in some ways, they were more confused and surprised than those who saw it as their task to channel or stop them. I also used the book, or I wanted to use the book, to reflect on the idea of emancipation. The idea of emancipation, it was one of the, to call it a buzzword is just not a strong enough expression. It was one of the kind of words of the era in the mid 19th century. Heinrich Heine said, you know, we're now in an age where the only road into the future is via emancipation, the emancipation of everyone, the emancipation of the Jews, the emancipation of African captives, the emancipation of Catholics in Britain. Interestingly enough, he did not refer to the emancipation of women. I'll come to that in a moment. But in any case, uh, many commentators referred to emancipation as a word, or, well, they, they bear witness to the fact that it has undergone, undergone a huge process of semantic inflation. It becomes a word through which time flows. And what emancipation meant was a linear movement into a future and better state of affairs. Unfortunately, the reality was very, very different. There was no linear movement into a better state of affairs. And one of the hopes I had for this book that was that it would do justice in particular to the place of women in these events. I don't want to be under misunderstood here. I don't mean, as historians sometimes understand it, I don't mean going out in search of shy, marginal female figures and sort of coaxing them gently onto the stage. Come on, come on, that's all right. Come into the centre. I mean simply making sense of the fact that women were right in the middle of the revolutionary experience from the very beginning. And if you look at images of the revolution of 1848, you see them absolutely everywhere, even on the barricades, not just, as though you often see that happening as well, bringing food or tea or coffee uh, or making bullets for the men, but also themselves firing uh, weapons and taking part in the combat. And there are numerous examples of women in Paris, for example, with badly burned faces from powder, powder burns, including one woman who was a 72-year-old widow and led a gang of men in, in, in uh, defending a barricade against uh, the troops and in the process was quite seriously wounded. Women organised during these revolutions on a stupendous scale. They formed clubs, associations, newspapers, not to mention their role, as I've just mentioned, as fighters and protesters, protesters in most of the key theatres of conflict. But what's interesting is how many male narratives of 1848 move them to the margins. And we, we encounter the women often in male narratives um, waving from windows. So they'll say there was a, a massive tumult on the streets and how charming it was to see the women uh, waving from windows or throwing cockades or flowers from windows, uh, how lovely that they were there too. But that does not do justice to their role. And in fact, one of the interesting things about the women of this era is that their, the quality of their witness to the events of 1848. There's Margaret Fuller, the American journalist and feminist who was in Rome during the Roman Republic and wrote far and away the richest and most evocative account of the events. And here is uh, Marie Dagou, who wrote under a male pseudonym, Daniel Stern, what is far and away the best history of the French Revolution of 1848. Uh, and do I have another one? That's enough for now. And there's the L'Opinion des Femmes, um, founded by uh, French uh, women activists in order to advocate for women's cause. And what's interesting about the <coughs> accounts that women offer of 1848 is that, that, is that they're very different from the accounts we have from men. Because in the eyes of men, if you think about how men saw each other in these revolutionary events, they saw each other as republicans, reactionaries, uh, monarchists, liberals, liars, traitors, renegades, enemies, allies, I'm just quoting from various different sources, mountebanks, firebrands, communists, and so on. But women could, occasionally at least, perceive the participants in these violent revolutionary political um, altercations as men trapped in the rivalries and antipathies of politics. And in L'Opinion des Femmes, the socialist Jeanne de Rouen suggested that women viewed the events of 1848 uh, of revolution fundamentally differently from their male counterparts. Women, she declared, whatever their political views, were united in seeking what she described as a policy of peace and labor. Where men, and she went on to say, they, what women wanted to do was to replace the egoistic and cruel policy that drove men to destroy each other. And I quote, where men see nothing but the struggle and feel nothing but the hatred, women see the suffering produced by the struggle and feel the pity. So she saw a fundamental difference in the way that the two groups saw these events. 
for the enslaved captives of the French Empire, the Revolution of 1848 brought a breathtaking moment of profound historical significance. And there's endless evidence that they recognized how fundamental this was. And yet the abolition of slavery did not mean the same as what we might think of as emancipation. To abolish slavery was one thing, to remove the many disabilities associated with former slave status was very much another. There we see one of the proclamations on Guadeloupe of the Il n'y a plus d'esclaves à la Guadeloupe. Uh, and there we see a proclamation of abolition on Réunion Island. A lot of French Republican images of the abolition capture this notion of grateful captives, you know, thankfully receiving the abolition. In fact, it was not like that at all. The, uh, the captives on these islands seized their freedom before the abolition decree arrived. The news arrived that the provisional government intended in due course to issue a decree of abolition, and that was enough. The whole of Martinique and Guadeloupe went up into, it became impossible to make anyone work, and there was violence and, um, you know, the, the dis disputation of power. And Governor Rostolan, you can see him in this image that I just showed you, Governor Rostolan, seen here generously offering the decree, was in fact forced to emancipate everybody in a kind of improvised action for which he had no authorization before the actual decree arrived on the island. And there are other cases as well. Going back here. There's the, on the Danish Caribbean, we see the same proclamation, more or less. And there are other cases as well. We find a similar temporal divide in the case of the European Jews, who were freed of a lot of their civil disabilities, but a lot of these civil disabilities were then subsequently reimposed, at least in many parts of Central Europe. And the same happened even to the so-called Roma slaves, one of the less well-known group, uh, enslaved gypsies of Central Europe, in particular the Hungarian and Romanian lands, who were re-enslaved as soon as the Romanian Revolution came to an end. They were liberated and then re-enslaved. But if we take a step back from these processes, five minutes, when we, if we take a step back, one thing that's very striking about these processes of emancipation is that they all have the same narrative shape. There's a surge of interest in emancipation around the end of the 18th century, Les Amis des Noirs, you know, Olympe de Gouges, um, and so on, Wollstonecraft, uh, and then it subsides in the, in the period after 1815, and then it surges again in the 1840s, then it subsides, and so on. There's a wave-like structure to all of these emancipations, and it's interesting to think about what that means. Then finally, there's the fact that this is not just about legislative reforms. Women achieve remarkably little in 1848 for all their struggle. But the process of advocacy itself strengthens networks or creates new networks. And many of these networks survive into the next generations to go on building the case for the emancipation of women. What matters, Julius Furst, the Jewish advocate for Jewish civil rights, wrote in 1851, what matters is not the result, but rather the activity that gave birth to this outcome. And I have a picture, I think, of Julius Furst. There he is there. And one struck at the end, if you look at these emancip emancipation processes and how slow they are and how non-linear, uh, then one is struck by the special quality of gender and racial inequality as particularly or even uniquely sticky and intractable forms of discrimination. Now, there's a lot more one could say about this revolution. It was an anarchic, sprawling monster event, and writing about it or even reading about it is a bit like, I hope reading my book isn't like this, but is a bit like driving around for the first time without Google Maps in the suburbs of Los Angeles. It just goes on and on and on. But before I finish, there is one last issue I wanted to touch on. And that is, when I was at school, I hated these revolutions because the teacher told us, and I remember that he said, um, uh, he said, people, these revolutions were complicated and they were a failure. And I remember thinking, hmm, complexity and failure are a very unattractive combination. And I'm not sure I want to learn any more about these horrid events. Uh, well, they most certainly were complex. And if I were to do a diagram of 1848, I'm not that sort of historian who does diagrams, but if I were, it would look a bit like this. <laughs> This is a causal loop diagram of Mexico's cartel, drug cartel problem. This is how you solve the drug cartel problem. Perhaps the key, we have the key here to why it hasn't yet been solved. Um, there's a, a fantastic Australian diagram of how to control COVID uh, infections done by an Australian, um, a bunch of Australian scientists. And my favorite one, this is the Afghanistan stability causal loop diagram. <laughs> That's just a working draft. It got a lot more complicated after that. 
Um, and that was done by a sort of, you know, a, a management consultancy that came up with that helpful uh, outline. Now, I mean, I, of course, I'm not going to do a, a diagram of 1848, but if I did, it would look a little bit like that, right? So, yes, they were complex, and there's nothing we can do about that. They were complex because they embodied the hopes and fears of so many different stakeholders. You know, one person's dream was always another person's nightmare. And in this context, we can also see lots of parallels with the present. Here's the chamber of the French uh, Constituent National Assembly being invaded by, um, actually, in fact, in total, thousands of radicals who came in and, um, and th you know, terrified the, the deputies uh, and announced that the chamber had been shut down. It was a corrupt chamber. The elections were a hoax and so on. And I couldn't help, when I was reading about that, be reminded of this man here, um, the, the QAnon shaman, um, who, you know, similarly invaded. Now, I'm not going to say that the radicals of Paris and the sort of Trumpian, you know, whatever that, that is, um, people in the, in the capital are the same. They're radically and deeply different. But what's interesting is the formal analogy, you know, the breach of a chamber because a, an election has allegedly been stolen. That's what's interesting. Coming from the left on one occasion and then, you know, uh, a long time later in our own time from the right. And it's really interesting to ponder on these formal resonances uh, uh, that, that Mark Twain called rhymes. He said history doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. And there's another connection, the overloading of contemporaries with too much information, too many newspapers, too many points of view. It's amazing how many liberals are saying by the early summer of 1848, freedom of the press was a beautiful idea, but actually was it that good an idea? And there we see someone who's had a bit much, and so on. And here we see another thing. Um, I've just included her because this is another parallel with the present. Here you can see a lady from, she's the Gilet Jaune, but uh, and that, the, the, the lady on the horse is from a painting by Philippe Porto of a young Republican woman who's challenging Lamartine in front of the Hôtel de Ville right at the beginning of the revolution. And these parallels, I think, are very interesting. The emergence of, uh, of, of political movements that don't have a clear trajectory, the general sense of churn and disturbance without a clear sense of direction, that's a very 1848 phenomenon. And it would be interesting to think about why this is the case. Why are we re-entering this period of um, churn and disturbance without a clear sense of where we're going? And I wanted to close, basically, by saying, rather than thinking about the 1848 revolutions in, in terms of success or failure, I certainly don't think they were a failure. They were too consequential for that. We could talk about that perhaps in discussion. But I also don't think they were a success. I think success and failure are both equally inadequate ways of thinking about what happened in 1848. It, it helps, it's more helpful to think of 1848 as the particle collision chamber in the middle of Europe's 19th century. Everybody who was around and active got thrown into this chamber, everything got mashed together, pushed out of shape, and it came out the other side, sometimes fragmented into 100 pieces and showered through the rest of the century. Everybody and everything was changed by these revolutions, and that's why I think they remain a uniquely interesting thing to think about, a uniquely, uniquely interesting object of historical contemplation. We're still living with the consequences of that rich and suggestive moment in the history of Europe. Thank you very much. I forgot to introduce Chris also by saying that he is one of the most truly spectacular European historians who also gives us a sense of the European dynamic of the history that took place here. And you notice this energy, the dynamics of European history as narrated by Chris yourself. Um, before we have a discussion with the audience, I first would like to invite Anneline de Dijn to give her thoughts on do we need a democratic revolution? Do democracies need a revolution? Sorry. Christopher Clarke's revolutionary spring is a remarkable, even a magnificent achievement. Um, and as you know, here in the Low Countries, we don't use words like magnificent lightly. The 1848 revolutions, like their late 18th century predecessor, have been the subject of sustained research and historical debate practically from the very moment they erupted. Clark has managed to absorb and master this enormous body of literature, producing an elegant and highly readable synthesis. I especially enjoyed the many vignettes and telling 
gory, bizarre, and amusing details that um, uh, make the history of Clark's book, uh, that Clark describes in his book, come alive, and of which you got a taste tonight. But Clark's book is not just an elegant synthesis, it also makes a number of new and original claims. Um, thus, Clark highlights, as you just heard, the European character of the 1848 revolutions, a dimension that has become obscured in the existing literature, which tends to focus on the national trajectories of these revolutions. But the most important of these new claims uh, made in the book, in my view, is that the 1848 revolutions were not a failure as they've usually been described. Instead, Clark wants us to see that these revolutions were an important turning point in European history and to a lesser extent in uh, global history, that they were, in his words, deeply consequential. The 1848 revolutions, he argues, obviously did not create a Europe of democratic republics as many revolutionaries had hoped, but they did um, change the constitutional framework of European states in meaningful ways. In the Netherlands, for instance, fear of revolutionary upheaval led to the demise of the neo absolutist regime introduced in 1813 and its replacement with a liberal constitutional monarchy in which the king's personal power was made subservient to parliament. In France, the democratic republic created by the February Revolution collapsed after a few years, but it was not replaced with anything resembling what had come before. Napoleon III's Second Empire obviously drew in many ways on the example of his most more famous uncle. But having won power via the electoral ray, rather than account of his military prowess, Napoleon III also created a new template for regime change that prefigured the populist authoritarian regimes of the 20th century, rather than harking back to the late 18th. Even in countries like Austria, where the counter revolution was particularly successful, Clark shows the policies adopted by uh, the new absolutist administration of the 1850s reflected a new order of priorities that took account of a much broader range of social and economic interests than it had been the case in the pre-1848 period. These are all important points, and Clark is quite persuasive in arguing that the 1848 revolutions had a deep and lasting impact on European political history. Yet, I'm not wholly persuaded by um, the stronger version of his claim that the 1848 revolutions were not just impactful, but also that they were not a failure. And it's, it is hard um, when you say that something is not a failure not to understand that you're also saying that they were a success. And I will conclude my remarks, although I know that's not um, you know, literally what you're trying to say. And I will conclude my remarks by trying to explain why I think that we can and should continue to label these revolutions as, as such, so as failures. Yes, the 1848 revolutions were impactful, but they were impactful because they failed. It is in their failure that they were impactful. Um, revolutions, as Clark himself emphasizes, are not just natural events, but political ones. They are made by historical actors with particular objectives and intentions. And when viewed from this perspective, the 1848 revolutions, I would argue, largely failed uh, in doing what they set out to do. That's perhaps most easily discernible in the case of the February Revolution in France. That revolution was directed quite explicitly against the elitist liberal regime um, headed by the July monarchy, a regime in which political power was literally monopolized by the 1%. That is um, uh, the number of people enfranchised in the July Revolution. Uh, July monarchy, sorry. The revolutionaries who took to the streets in 1848 set out to replace this regime with a more democratic one. Although it bears uh, noticing, obviously, that their definition of democracy was a highly misogynistic one. That is why manhood suffrage was uh, one of their key demands. But, it is, uh, but a few years later, um, it was quite obvious that the February Revolution had failed to bring about a more democratic regime. And that was not just a huge setback for the democratization of France, but arguably um, for the democratization elsewhere in Europe as well. In Britain, for instance, conservative elites eagerly seized upon events in France uh, to nip the Chartist movement in the bud. Now, we will, of course, never know whether Britain would have democratized more rapidly without 1848. But it is clear that the failure of the February Revolution, and especially the violence of the June days, provided powerful ammunition for democracy's conservative opponents. 
the British historian Thomas Babington Macaulay, for instance, concluded from, the February, from his observation of the February Revolution that democracy and civilization, as he put it, simply cannot coexist. But it wasn't just conservatives who concluded from 1848 that democracy simply uh, couldn't work, that it was an unworkable regime. On the opposite side of the political spectrum, Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels came to a remarkably similar conclusion. The lesson they drew from 1848 was that in a capitalist regime, democracy would always remain a front for the protection of elite interests. And that true emancipation, the emancipation of the labor classes, could only come about through the abolition of private property. Now, it is worth noting that this remained a key tenet of Marxism even after Marx and Engels' conversion to do the parliamentary route to the communist society um, in the 19, 1860s. And as a result, Marxist parties, even after they shed their revolutionary aspirations, never were fully committed to parliamentary democracy, as Sherry Berman, for instance, has emphasized. Instead, they saw manhood suffrage as an intermediary stage um, in the road to the establishment of the dictatorship of the proletariat and the establishment of a communist society. And um, I would argue that this um, sort of uh, uh, commitment of Marxist parties was one of many factors delaying the advent of democracy in Europe. The 1848 revolutions, in short, were um, in intent democratic revolutions, yet they failed to create sustainable democratic regimes. And because they failed to do so, they provide democracy's opponents on both the right and the left with powerful arguments against popular government. As a result, um, they probably set back the advent of democracy in Europe by at least a few decades. And in that sense, they were impactful, but they were impactful in that they failed. Thank you so much, Anneline. Now we will be trying to get uh, Professor Sluga uh, here with us. Glenda, are you there? Can you see us? Yeah. Hi. Hi. Can you see me? So uh, it's lovely to see you after all. I'm very sad that you're not here in person. But um, please, from your home and your university in Florence, uh, join us in the discussion and perhaps you can respond to Chris' lecture as well. All right. Thank you so much, Beatrice. I want to thank you, first of all, for inviting me in the first place and then accommodating my absence. But I do like to blame, uh, perhaps not revolutions, but strikes and uh, NATO uh, rather than myself. So um, I you know, really um, love this book. And, you know, like Annalene, I could spend some time discussing what is wonderful about it. And I want to you know, begin by saying that, you know, Chris is really... Um, uh, produced an artful and evocative uh, European tableau uh, that draws us into to, you know, what he already said was a complex story of life and politics. And his narrative, you know, to me seems both artful and uh, alive all at the same time, to the extent I think, you know, one wants to go off and keep reading it rather than uh, to listen to me uh, tell you what lessons it might have uh, for us uh, as a history of the past speaking to the present. And I think, um, you know, it is true, though, that there is every indication in the book itself that Chris actually does want us to learn from that past. Uh, he's already said a few times that he thinks of 1848 not as a failure, but as leading um, to new political forms, as he talks about in the book, that connect to our own world. So I'm going to really concentrate on four uh, possible lessons and uh, I'm interested in what Chris might have to say about them. And they speak to some of the comments he's already made in such you know, an engaging way um, uh, regarding uh, um, the history of 1848. So the first um, that I want to mention and that particularly fascinated me is the idea that the 1848 revolutions made governments see the value of political programs uh, that could be communicated to populations. So that after 1848, you have governments that are much more responsive to the idea that they need to um, garner the support of populations. And he notes in particular the distinctiveness of the post-revolutionary government's economic interventions across Europe. 
and he says that this new emphasis on the need for policy programs was accompanied by a growing tendency to conceptualise the state as distinct from society and at the same time by um, growing the prestige of ministries of finance and the men who led them. So I think post-1848 brings us then into a familiar world in which uh, prosperity is not only associated with political peace, an older idea, but a newer one, according to um, Chris, and that is that political peace is important for generating prosperity so that material progress itself becomes the ultimate good. So I wouldn't mind hearing some more about how, um, you know, uh, how he thinks that fits into the picture of the, of the importance of 1848. My second point uh, is in regard to um, the situation, thinking and agency of women, which he's already discussed uh, in his lecture. And I think some of the most richest and empathetic sections of the book really engage uh, the, um, uh, his accounts of um, women's experiences and, and their narratives. And I think this, in many ways, makes a revolutionary spring uh, the definitive account now of women in 1848, uh, both for uh, understanding their political presence in the revolutions of 1848 and their relative historical absence. So by bringing together not only what we already knew, but adding a lot of new material to uh, this account. And we find out in great detail the circumstances that lead to women's involvement in 1848, from labour conditions to legal codes and social norms. And we discover in, in a really engaging detail um, the, the ways in which uh, women engaged the revolution, as he's already mentioned. Uh, now, what's the lesson? Well, not failure, uh, apparently, but um, he does uh, emphasise the resistance after 1848 to fixing the problem of sexual inequality, having very carefully outlined the complexities and, and the different uh, um, dimensions and angles from which you know, women had to tackle uh, the, the question of their inequality. And... He says that, you know, women across Western Europe would return to the fight during the revolutions of 1848, demanding access to new assemblies, claiming their civil rights, forming political clubs and publishing newspapers. But even as new parliaments ratified new constitutions and feudal land tenures were abolished, the fortified architecture of women's civil and political inferiority held firm. So... There is a lesson here, and one of, or a number of them, and one of them is the separation out, I think, of women's rights and the constitution-focused politics of democracy in this post-1848 moment. And, you know, I wouldn't mind hearing him say more about how, you know, in the same way as in um, that first point we have the separation of the economic and the political, uh, here we've got the separation out of an idea of the political and social questions that particularly affect women in, um, through the 19th and 20th centuries. But again, you know, the empathy of the text is just really striking. Uh, this is Chris. It is difficult to decide what is more striking, the tireless advocacy of the women activists or the immovability of the patriarchal structure they were challenging. Those women who pushed directly at the legal and political disabilities of women achieved remarkably little. And perhaps even more depressingly, he concludes that women would end up having more success, uh, then again in his words, when they worked with rather than against the prevailing norms and expectations of mid-19th century society. You know, when they acted as mothers or in the interest of the country or children, otherwise they would face increasing hostility and condescension for being in the, in the public sphere. So we have that to set against the idea that 1848 uh, generated new networks, ideas and arguments, uh, especially for women who dared to challenge the gender politics of patriarchy. So there is this, in, I mean, and maybe we, we rest in this paradox and, um, and think not about failure but about the paradoxical nature of politics uh, th th through the 19th century. But again, you know, interesting to, co to contemplate if one doesn't go with failure where we end up. Um, so my final point then is uh, to do with, um, in fact, the idea that he uh, talks about and has talked about in uh, early on, and that is that um, we learn that in 1848, in contrast to 1789, the past has taken on uh, 
a political significance. 1848 involved a consciousness of history, of making history happen in the present, and we learn about the extent to which 1789 colours the self-consciousness of political actors and 1848 itself, to the extent that Tocqueville comments we had staged a play about the French Revolution. I was very interested in um, the significance of the story of 1848 or the history of 1848 as a revolution for democracies afterwards. How important was this history to the fate of democracy in the aftermath of 1848 and through the latter 19th century? Did the history of 1848 actually fail to take hold in the democratic imagination? Uh, you know, I, I, Chris, you started out by talking about the uh, memory managers who incorporated this story into these national um, narratives, and I think that's such an astute observation. Uh, is there something else then that we can say about the relevance of uh, the stories of revolution to uh, democracies in the later 19th and 20th century apart from that? And here I probably want to go back to uh, the, the generosity with which uh, Chris talks about other historians. And in the book, those historians, uh, are, you know, informally, unofficially, the, the women who narrate uh, the 1848 revolution in um, all sorts of forms, including histories of, of, of a kind. And, uh, you know, giving space to women to speak not only as the agents of change but as the authors of those histories, uh, I think, is... Um, a really useful resource, and we might go turning to those women for some lessons on the relevance of 1848. You know, do their stories bring to, back together the social and the political uh, and the economic? Do they offer other kinds of ways of thinking about politics in the latter 19th century and the early 20th? You know, overall, you know, I want to thank you for opening up a truly European history and expanding our, our idea of what European historians can do and think uh, with the past. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Glenda, for your very thoughtful comments, uh, as um, Annaline did before you. Um, Chris, aren't yeah. you overwhelmed by these questions? Uh, I'm, I'm overwhelmed by the, uh, by the astuteness and the generosity of the comments from, from Annaline and Glenda, and thank you both very, very much. What wonderful comments. Um, shall I just respond briefly to a couple of points? Um, the first one relates to failure. Look, you know, you're obviously right. <laughs> there is a lot of failure happening in 1848 if you focus on particular groups which are defined by particular intentions which are not realised. I mean, you could say that all these women, you know, who are the, the women associated with L'Opinion des Femmes, they failed. I mean, they didn't get legislative transformation. They didn't... Citoyenne never became equal with citoyen and so on, which is one of the things they, they were calling for. Um, democracy didn't happen uh, and so on. I mean, the relationship between... Uh, but f two points about that. The first is that this revolutions, that these revolutions, and I know you know this, so who am I saying this to, you know, they weren't, em they weren't embodying a single intention. That's the whole problem, that you can find individual groups that fail, but in order to say the whole thing or to, 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 to capture the whole thing under the rubric of failure, what you have to do is decide that the revolution is really just the affair of those groups who didn't succeed. And so then you'd have to say, well, you know, democracy didn't happen, so the democratic movement was a failure and the revolutions were a failure. But what if other groups are involved in the revolutions, like liberals, for example? In many ways, liberals succeeded. You know, they got a huge amount out of this. They got their constitutional order. In many places, you have parliamentary systems, you have elections, you have um, the legally necessary recording of parliamentary debates, Hansard style, and so on. These are all liberal demands, and a lot of them are realised. And so, you, you, and you can even think of, you know, conservatives who are tremendous winners from 1848, like Bismarck in many ways, um, who, you know, repeatedly refers in his memoirs to 1848 as the moment that made him. He's a man of 1848, completely a creature of that moment. So, you know, um, it's true, there is failure for particular individuals and for particular groups, and certain objectives fail to be realised. But the revolutions are, the, precisely the complexity of the revolution means that, you know, we have to think of it in terms of of many, it seems to me anyway, I wanted to bring in many different stakeholders with conflicting intentions and think about the impact of that, you know, complex interaction. 
And sometimes it's hard to draw a line between the revolutionaries and the counter-revolutionaries. I mean, was Napoleon a revolutionary, Napoleon III, or a counter-revolutionary? I mean, he said in his um, Les Idées Napoléoniennes, which, he, which is a fairly good blueprint for what he does after 1849, um, first as president of the republic and then as, later as emperor, uh, he said, you know, my, what my uncle understood, his great, the great Napoleon I, he said was that there's no point in trying to stop a revolution. You can't stop revolution. You can't stop progress. But what you can do is take it off the streets and put it inside government. And that was what he wanted to do. A third of the préfets of the new police um, administrations in Paris are former Democrats. The guy who ran the, um, you know, the, the interior ministry, the sort of super ministry that dominated Austrian politics in the 50s, was a man who had been on police search lists, Alexander, Dr. Alexander Bach. He made a walk across the... He, he made a long march through the institutions, as they used to say about the 68ers, you know. So I think there are 48ers who you know, undergo a complex trajectory as they try and realize through state structures what previously they tried to realize through civil society-based movements. And there are, you know, complex ways in which discourses, which had been dissenting discourses, get absorbed by government, like the discourses of the social question or, or the statistical critiques, which become part of, you know, um, social critique in the 1830s and 40s, become part of the repertory of government. Now, that's not a necessarily progressive development in democratic terms. It's a move towards technocracy. But nevertheless, it's, it's too complex a uh, development, it seems to me, to be captured by the rubric of failure. So I, I, you know, I concede your observations, they're absolutely right. But I just think that the larger picture resists um, that argument for failure. That, in my view, it does. But, and then coming to um, what, what um, Glenda said, uh, thank you, Glenda, for your comments about the, the, the role that women play in this. Um, I think that, you know, um, it's, it's very interesting, this, the, the peculiar resistance that you refer to of patriarchy to women's enfranchisement um, is a remarkable fact. Once you just start thinking about it as not simply part of a natural order, and you listen, for example, to what Tocqueville has to say when he goes to a, a Republican fete in Paris, and um, this is in, in April 1848, and among the things that are on show are um, the so-called 500 young virgins. And these are women who've been brought from the workshops of Paris, and they're all dressed in white dresses, and they parade with, with carrying palms, and they're wearing oak leaf, you know, crowns and so on, garlands in their hair. And one of them presents a, a poem expressing her admiration for Lamartine and so on. Tocqueville looks on at these young women from the working class dist districts of Paris, and he is filled with the most visceral disgust. This is one of the great luminaries of liberalism. And he looks at these, and he's at these disgusting creatures. He's repelled by their physical appearance. Uh, now, that is noteworthy. Why is that there? Why does it feel... Why does Tocqueville... Uh, feel disgusted by the women? Why doesn't he feel angry with the people who organize this event if he doesn't like its politics? Why doesn't he say these revolting Republicans, they're always banging on about their republic and so on. Um, why does he focus on the women? And there's something really visceral in that, which I think also is present in the history of racial discrimination, where people can, as it were, reduce their, their, their arguments to almost to bodily reflexes. It's the same as what happened in, in, the, in the Frankfurt Parliament. In many ways, a very admirable institution with a large radical minority and a big liberal majority. Uh, when the question of women's enfranchisement was, dis was discussed, loud guffaws, really loud belly laughs from all over the chamber from these men who couldn't help themselves. Just, they weren't doing it to mock the women. They just found it genuinely hilarious that anyone would think about doing this. So there is something really worth thinking about. The you know, peculiar places in the, si in, the, in the system where change is simply not happening, where the resistance is so strong. And that applies also even to the emancipated uh, African captives of the Sugar Islands who, you know, are emancipated in name, as to say the uh, slavery is abolished, but they then are then tied down to their parcelin, to their, to their land, by new laws, a new capitalist system of work 
uh, workbook laws and anti-vagabondage laws and so on that make that force them to work on the land that they traditionally worked on. So those moments of resistance are deeply, deeply interesting and worth uh, pondering on. And, and I think they are concentrated around those areas of gender and race, which are special. Because as Claire Desmar, the feminist, pointed out, you know, you can abolish feudalism, you can abolish, um, you know, you can create parliaments, you can create constitutional orders, you can deregulate economies, uh, but th there's still this profound resistance to change in particular areas. Um, I think that's mainly what I wanted to say in response, but, I, you know, uh, one last thought about the relationship between democracy and revolution, democracy and radicalism. It's true that the failure of radicalism has a delaying effect on the introduction of democracy, no question at all. But I think it works the other way around as well. The expansion of the Fran suffrage in France, for example, but also in many other European jurisdictions where the suffrage is expanded and for the first time you have quite a broad constituency voting for the deputies of a new parliament, in almost every location, this produces a very conservative outcome. So one of the problems that people like Proudhon have to struggle with is that, you know, even an almost universal franchise, manhood franchise, of course, it's always just the men, even an expansion of the franchise is not going to revolutionize the content of politics. It may have the opposite effect. It may bring conservative people from rural locations into the political process and empower liberal and even reactionary politics rather than the radical project. So in other words, the relationship between radical demands and democracies is more complex, uh, or it's, it's vexingly complex, at least for contemporaries. And you know, those parliamentary elections are a body blow to the left. And in a way, that struggle how do you achieve majoritarian status for a politics which is genuinely transformative remains the central you know, challenge of the left. Thank you so much, Chris. Could I just follow up in, in, in laying in front of you, all three of you, Glenda and Annaline and Chris, then uh, tonight's question as it's been announced on the poster. So the question, and it's, it's, it's a lead from you, Chris, do democracies need a revolution? So perhaps 1848, um, didn't need to be at all to, or did we need to go through 8048 to become a democracy, or was it just a delay? Well, need is a very normative concept, isn't it? <laughs> Which you don't normally like normative normative arguments. No, uh, no, we, I think we, it's we, we agree on that. Yes, um, I, it's an interesting question. Um, but do you want to answer it first, Annalene? And no, well, I think <laughs> <laughs> I'm sort of I'm funking now. Um, <coughs> Would you like to have a go at the question of tonight? Uh, sh sure. Mm. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, I think this is a. I think it's one of the key questions uh, in the history of democracy. Um, so, you know, eventually Europe democratized. This was a, a really long, drawn-out process, mm. and it involved a lot of violence. Um, yeah, including uh, a large-scale revolution. Um, but. If we focus on the effect of 1848 on the uh, liberal imagination, on the imagination of um, the people who were in power before 1848 and who largely remained in power after 1848, I would argue that it had a negative effect on their willingness to democratize their yeah. political regimes. That is um, one argument you can make. On the other hand, there's also uh, plenty of historians who would argue that you need sort of this fear from below um, from you know revolutionary people from below in order to get um, uh, these elites going, uh, and then the Dutch example is actually uh, uh, an illustration of how that might work. Even though we might know that the 1848 Constitution emphasized only 10% of, I believe, not just the population as a whole, but of the adult male population. So mm. that's again a tiny number of people who were enfranchised. Um, but if we look at all of the evidence together, then I, then I would argue that 1848 shows um, that revolutions are not, you know, that they're not conducive, they're not helpful um, in democracies. Why? Because they unleash violence yeah. um, in directions that um, uh, people who are interested in political change, uh, you know, might not be, um, you know, might not, you know, in, in unproductive ways. Mm. Um, and I, I think the British case is a really good example of how, uh, how that affects um, and how that stalls uh, necessary, uh, or all that stalls a political change. Um, so I think, again, I, it's a really thorny question. Um, I think it's naive to say that um, 
democracy would have arrived uh, without any violence at all. But I, I think that revolutionary violence, so violence uh, that accompanies regime change, um, in particular in the uh, 1848 revolutions, that, that in, the, in the longer run that slowed things down rather than, than that they did anything else. And I think um, um, a study by Daniel Ziblatt is yeah. uh, interesting in that regard. Um, so uh, he he shows that uh, what you really need um, for democracy to sort of uh, become institutionalized, you need the support of elites, in particular elites that might be interested in um, you know uh, you know preventing democracy or democratization from happening at all. Uh, and by focusing on the British case, he shows that as soon as these elites, British elites, uh, started losing their fear of democracy, and that happened for various, um, mostly contingent reasons. That is the, the, the sort of hinge uh, on which the eventual democratization of the British system, um, successful democratization of the British system happened. Uh, so that would again plead for looking at uh, elite actors rather than um, at uh, violence from below. I'm going to Glenda in a moment, but there's this great quote in your book about, uh, from a Dutch envoy who writes home and saying, in order to preempt the revolution that mm, happens yes. everywhere to take place here, we need to preempt the revolution here in making the reforms. So, uh, what's he say? Preempt rather than he's, to he's be preempted. It's, it's better to preempt than to be preempted. Than exactly. to be preempted. Yeah, he puts yeah. it very well. So, you need a revolution elsewhere in order to avoid one having here, perhaps. Um, Glenda, would you like to add to this discussion? Do democracies need a revolution? Um, I guess I, I was thinking of it in a slightly different way. And first of all, you know, I guess you know, revolutions might not necessarily be, um, you know, violent in extreme ways. There are different kinds of revolutions. And if we think of the you know, what we call the Arab Spring, you know, the fact of people coming to the square, you know, these revolutions of 1848 might be reminders of, um, useful reminders of the extent of ambition for political change and the spectrum of thinking about political change. In that sense, they fill out uh, the idea of democracy, the container. They put, they put into that empty container a much broader range of ideas and ambitions and expectations than we might otherwise know about. Mm. Um, and but we only know about them if the stories are told about them. So I, you know, just to go back to the point I made earlier, I'm really intrigued, and I think it's such a wonderful observation, I'm intrigued by uh, the ways in which the stories of 1789 are so crucial to um, the political agency and uh, um, thinking of the of many of the actors in the 1848 story. And it does strike me that the absence of women in stories about 1848 afterwards until, you know, the 1980s possibly and now, you know, um, more fleshed out in, in this account, you know, um, when they're not there, when the stories don't mirror the extent of ambition and expectation, we get a really, um, uh, you know, thinned out idea of democracy and what it should be or could be. So, you know, I, I think it's a really good question to ask precisely because it rem reminds us um, of, um, you know, the importance of the history of, you know, what we might want to call failure in, in some respects. Of You know, historians are different from political scientists in this way, I think. We are interested in the threads that get lost, for example, or only picked up much later. I mean, if anything, um, you know, the other, the other point that Chris makes is, you know that the the so-called failure of the of the women is a reminder that there is no progress, and that in fact, you know, democracy is you know an ongoing battle. Something that we know now, right? That if that it's not something you just rest on your laurels about. You've got to keep renegotiating, rethinking, um, uh, you know, political rights all the time, um, in order to not lose them. So I, I think it's a fantastic question, and I do think that you know, pondering these other aspects of, of, of that question are quite useful. So now your, yes. it's your turn, Chris. <laughs> yes, thank you for going. <laughs> thank you for leaping into the breach, Annalene. Yeah, um, I mean, I was thinking about this. The, the, there's a two fascinating comments. And the first thing I uh, thought that comes to me is that 
what, one of the things that's special about 1848 is that it happens in times of peace. There's no, uh, and it's not, by and large, its effects are not proliferated or deepened by warfare. There is warfare happening in 1848 in the wake of the revolution, but these are policing actions to restore you know, order. Um, they're not anything on a, which can be compared to the revolutionary wars which start in 1792 and continue right through the 90s and then become the Napoleonic Wars and so on. So in 1848, ideas and, and political effects have to move about in civilian clothes. They, 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 don't, they won't arrive in people's towns on the end of a bayonet um, as part of a sort of French invasion or an expansion of French power or the Grande Armée on the march uh, and so on. I think that, um, you know, liberals have a curious relationship with the sort of popular tumult that launches a revolution. They're, they're afraid of it, but they also need it. They need the fear of revolution in order to make an argument for a fundamental transformation of the kind that they want. Once they have what they want, they want to turn the tumult off and stop the revolution. And in fact, one of the deep divisions between revolutionaries in 1848 was between those who thought the revolution was an event, those who by and large people we think of as liberals, something that happened in the spring, and now you have to deal with its consequences, and those who thought it was a process, which had only just got going and had a long way to go, and those who, by and large, the people we think of as um, radicals. But there's an interesting sort of twist in this story, which is that after 1848, among those who think very hard about democracy are conservatives. You know, and you have people, Bismarck would be one example, but the Austrians also puzzle over this question. You know, Maybe the real lesson of 1848, they think, is that the masses are conservative and that a de democratic franchise, far from empowering the liberals, will actually empower the conservatives. Because once you get out to these little people, remember Trump's comment, we like the uneducated. Well, it's that kind of thing. You know, those people out there actually will support a conservative agenda. And, you know, um, so that's one of the insights that, you know, if you call it an insight. Bismarck I mean, had that insight in 1850 when he gave this lecture. We need a nation, the nation needs the king. Well, exactly. Yeah. And Bismarck then later shocked everybody, his friends and enemies included, um, in 1866 by arguing for an, a national manhood suffrage for the North German Confederation of 1866. And that suffrage is then carried over to the new Germany. A deeply shocking uh, move by Bismarck, um, you know, who was the last person anyone expected to speak up for democracy. So, you know, it's a strange world where democracy can be, you know, a weapon wielded by conservatives and even by reactionaries. As Bismarck put it, in a moment of crisis, the masses will always gravitate to the king. So um, there's also that, which kind of complicates this, the, the story in lots of ways. And then um, coming to, to Glenda's point about the, 17, the, the impact of narratives of early revolutions. I mean, as she says, as Glenda says, you know, 18, 1789 is just omnipresent. You, you can't emphasize it enough. They are thinking about this revolution all the time. And, you know, in a very famous and sort of damning um, par parodic summary, you know, Marx described 1848 as a sort of pathetic reiteration, a pathetic tiny parod parody of the original Great Revolution, a sort of regurgitated cornflake from the Great Revolutionary Breakfast. Um, but in fact, you know, in that essay where he says that, the 18th premier of Louis Napoleon, if you read through to the end of the essay, by the end of the essay, he's asking different questions. He's saying, why didn't 1848 turn out the way we expected? You know, what is it about this new Napoleonic regime that makes it appear so weirdly stable? What's going on? Because Marx never stopped. I mean, he was good at parody, but he never stopped at parody. He always went on trying to nut out the problems. So... He thinks that there's some, actually thinks, um, if you ask him on a, on a good day, um, that there's something very mysterious about the relationship between 1848 and, and, and 1789. And there's a lot of talk about this. I mean, one of the lessons of 1789, people thought, was that you start with a nice liberal revolution, and then that quickly becomes a terrifying Jacobin dictatorship. And conservatives always argued history is cyclical. If we have another revolution, it will quickly turn into, it will go radical and become tyrannical, and we'll lose freedom, and freedom will be destroyed. Um, and liberals' answer to this was, no, we're a learning species. You know, we've learned from 1793, 94. We've learned from Robespierre. Next time round, it will be different. We won't let the revolution go radical. And that's one of the reasons why, you know, they intervene, they, 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 they gravitate towards the conservative forces in 1848. It looks like a betrayal, but in some ways, it's an effort to in, in precisely to enact that idea that you want to stop the revolution when you hit the sweet point, you know, the sweet spot from a liberal point of view. 
And so then you shut out, of course, all those radical demands for participation, for social justice, and so on. So I see these, these um, things as kind of complicated. It's, it's always quite hard to debate about them because they have so many different sides. And as you turn them, they, you know, it's like a crystal. And every time you turn it, the, lights bounce, the light bounce out, bounces out in different directions. But anyway, thank you both for those wonderful comments. Please allow me to pose to you one last question before mm. I uh, open discussion up to the audience. And that's the question to the reminiscences of the perils of the echoes for today. I mean, your book is quite full um, for an historian who really dives deep into history. You make quite some allusions to the present, to the Arab Spring, to the uh, 6th January insurrection in the United States, also even to the insurrection in Berlin the year before. So. Um, what lessons is perhaps too harshly put it, too rigidly put, and uh, rhyme is uh, perhaps the better word. Mm. So how may we rhyme on 8048 for today? Are there lessons for the radicals, for the liberals, for the conservatives? Mm. Or what, what would you like to give to... If, 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 well, if yeah. I could say, first of all, you know, I, you know I, historians always react a bit allergically when people say, what are the lessons? And we, we, you know, we always say, there aren't any lessons, and that's why we often don't get asked back to talk shows and <laughs> so on. Um, but, you know, I think that, um, you know, if there is a lesson, one lesson is that, um, you know, the, the liberals and the radicals of 1848, self-evidently and obviously, um, conducted a kind of dialogue of the, well, actually I'm looking now for the right phrase for it. They, they, they spoke past each other. They talked at each other rather than talk to each other. They didn't really listen to each other's arguments. And so you have liberals just denouncing radicals as communists. That the, the, the term communist gets used very widely as a sort of you know, bugbear term just to terrorize people. And on the left, you find people mocking the parliaments, the parla, parla, parlament, and so on, as a useless chatting shop and so on. And of course, when they attack each other like that, they're both wrong. They need to be listening to each other. And the center of politics needs to be very broad and very, very variegated. And you can't have, and this is the lesson of Guizot's failed uh, government of 1848, the one that collapses when the, when the February Revolution breaks out, that he thought he, was, he represented the liberal center. But he represented the center in a mathematical sense. It was equidistant from royalism and from hardline radicalism. But it was just a tiny point, an infinitely tiny point in the middle. But the center, if it's going to function as a place for politics, needs to be very variegated and involve lots of conflicting you know, uh, positions and the mediation between, among them. That would be one lesson of 1848. Um, and the other thing I was just going to say was, that if we ask ourselves why these rhymes are there, if, if anybody, if, you know, between now and then, it seems to me that, that the reason is that in 1848, they hadn't yet entered something that we're now leaving, which I suppose you could call high modernity, you know, the era of huge and powerful political parties, of national radio, national television audiences, of national newspapers, you know, um, these large disciplining formations of modernity, were not there yet. And so in 1848, there's a politics is fluxy and fluid and very multiple. And maybe we're re-entering an era of fluxy, multiple politics. If you look at what's happening to the Conservative Party in Britain right now, it's sort of melting in front of our eyes. Um, and Or the Republican Party. What's happened to the Republican Party? You know, um, so it may be that we're, thanks to the social media and other transformations, we're entering into a period of, you know, semi-opaque, complex interactions, which may be a little bit like 1848, or at least the period, you know, up to and including the revolutions. How do you feel about such echoes, <laughs> reverences? <laughs> um, well, um, I want to uh, link that to something that uh, Glenda uh, was uh, putting on the table, which is um, what role did 1848 play in uh, European collective memory um, in the subsequent uh, decades? Um, and I think one of the things we can learn, not perhaps from 1848, but from the... Uh, I mean, I'm fascinated by um, the persistence of certain tropes that were introduced in, um, uh, in the aftermath of 1848. And one of these, uh, because I think that a lot of these tropes had an, uh, an anti-democratic um, effect and that they, uh, they were unhelpful and they hindered the establishment of stable democracies in Europe. And one of these tropes is that 
the masses are naturally prone to uh, populist authoritarianism. Yep. That was one lesson that the liberals definitely thought that they had learned from 1848. <laughs> also because they felt that um, you know, this was a lesson they had already learned once in 1789. And then uh, 1848 came along and it was just uh, confirmed. Mm. Um, uh, so uh, that is... Um, and, and um, you, the, the, this trope had a really long uh, shelf life because it then reappears again in the interwar period uh, when it is used to explain the rise of, um, uh, of, of uh, Nazism and fascism. Mm. Um, and I think there's lots of things that are wrong with this trope. I think it is um, really easy to show that um, that's simply not what happened in 1848. Um, and I think it's important that we're aware, but I think it's important that we, that we are aware that our collective memory uh, continues to be shaped by, by this um, supposed lesson from 1848. And the second lesson um, has survived a little bit less uh, well. Um, so that is the lesson that uh, Marx and Engels uh, thought they had learned from 1848, which is that democracy or that political institutions in and of themselves um, uh, are very important, but that the real key uh, things are, um, you know, uh, um, happening in the economic arena, and that if you want uh, true regime change uh, and true democratic regime change, uh, what you need is to get rid of capitalism. Um, and I wouldn't say that this is, I mean, that is definitely a trope that was hugely influential, <laughs> as we all know, but um, it, I wouldn't say it's as influential today as it was uh, 30 years ago. Um, uh, or um, um, or in the uh, late 19th century, uh, but but sometimes you do he still hear echoes uh, of that trope. Uh, when I talk to Marxist friends, um, all of a sudden I I realize that I again have Marxist friends <laughs> that, that, that started happening in 2008. <laughs> Before 2008, I didn't have any Marxist friends, and now I have um, <laughs> lots of them. Uh, and uh, obviously, there are very different, um, yeah, I mean, but, but sometimes, so sometimes you do hear the, these echoes, uh, sort of a, a cynical attitude towards democracy as a, a regime that is not um, conducive to bringing about radical change of the uh, systematic kind that if you are a committed Marxist would like to see. And I, I also think that's a trope we should not want, I mean, we should just get rid of that trope altogether. Uh, mm -hmm. Good. Um, Glenda, how do you feel about those echoes? Uh, well, I think a lot, you know, really interesting points have already been made. I'd only say, um, you know, I've, one could take the, the lesson and, yeah, I know, we, I quite like the ideas of, of reading back lessons um, as, as lessons about um, that I think that you are able to um, convey extremely well, Chris, that you have a strong sense of, you know, the psychology of, um, this experience. It's, you can read it as a, you know, a psych psychological thriller. You know, what you've got all these desperate people or people, you know, with, a, with a varied kind of states in change and transformation. And even in what you describe now as, you know, I don't think you use it in a book, but fluxy sort of atmosphere, um, you still get what you, what you also described at the beginning of your talk as a cascade you know, a cascade effect connecting all these people, even in the midst of so many different um, ambitions and objectives and experiences. Um, and I wonder whether, you know, that isn't a lesson for today in the sense of the, you know, the extent of, um, of, uh, of the depth of people's psychological, you know, um, uh, experience of, you know, of this post-modern, transformative, you know, Anthropocene moment of climate change, et cetera, you have Extinction Rebellion and all the rest. And I wonder whether the lesson isn't there about how the, the cascading effect can happen, even in a fluxy context, if the challenges and the circumstances are, um, are there. And maybe this time the scale isn't European. I mean, that's the other really interesting thing about your story that it's European in the absence of a, of a European political structure. And I wonder in our own times whether if anything like this takes effect in this in fluxy moment of cascading politics, whether uh, the scope will be bigger in Europe. Thank you so much, Glenda. Um, now I would like to ask people in the audience whether they have any questions for our esteemed audience, for Glenda, for Anneline and for Chris, 
there are two mics in the hallway. Please don't grab the mic, just talk into it. And um, people from the KNOA will hold them up to you. And could you introduce your name briefly first? Yes, uh, my name is uh, Hans Wansink. And uh, I would like to ask a uh, question about uh, the Communist Manifesto, which you just uh, showed to us. But uh, in your 800 pages book, you don't discuss uh, the manifesto, which of course was published in 1848 at all. So do you consider the manifesto at the time as irrelevant? I wouldn't say it was irrelevant, no, but Marx is one very marginal voice in the socialist world of 1848. Um, and the readership of the Communist Manifesto is not very large. And it's interesting to ask why um, it is not very large, but it's not one of the central um, utterances of 1848. It's a fascinating diagnosis. But actually, I found when I... Marx is very present in my book, but the manifesto... You're quite right, the manifesto isn't. I found Marx um, much more interesting as, um, as a reflector on contemporary events. His journalism is absolutely brilliant and incredibly... Um, percipient and, you know, analytically deep. And uh, so I, I followed him through the, him and Engels, through the events of 1848-49, um, trying to sort of revisit him, check out what he's saying about each new stage of the revolution. But I think the, the manifesto is important for a history of the communist movement, obviously, or for the, or for the history of late 19th, the second half of the 19th century, um, the history of the socialism in that era. But I didn't think it was a, a document which had a tremendous impact on contemporaries. That was why I didn't place uh, much emphasis on it. Well, maybe you uh, should uh, have uh, <laughs> had, had, explained had more it to uh, say. as well. I mean, yeah, yeah but, uh, you're, you're right. It's a kind of, and it's a but lacuna. They're... And when, if, uh, if I rewrite the book, I will definitely say more about the <laughs> communist. But, um, there, is all, <laughs> there is more to say. But I just have to say that, you know, every day, um, for, for a long time, I've stopped doing it now, I would wake up in the morning disturbed by the thought of something that should be in the book but wasn't. <laughs> um, <laughs> Maybe this was one. That was, yes, that's another one. Thank you. Actually, you, d you do quote the manifesto in saying that Marx was very astute in observing that it was Europe that was in turmoil. Well, it's that's true. I do yeah. mention that, but that's in yeah. sort of en passant. But you're yeah. quite right. It's not a central, um, not a central theme. Um, the gentleman here in the second row, Devin. No, no, no. So, sorry, in the second, the second oh, row. Oh, sorry. First. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> And, and then, then you, sir, after that. Um, yeah. Is it okay? If I, yeah, thanks. <laughs> uh, I'm Devin Vartia. Uh, thank you for a very rich and entertaining talk. Uh, my question is just about your comment that uh, the revolutions made revolutionaries rather than the other way around. Mm. And, but given the fact that this is post-1789 and there was, you could call, a script of revolution, I'm just wondering if you would qualify that in the sense that the fact that there was that the French Revolution gave us the modern script of revolution, it gave us the neologism of the late 18th century, revolutionary. Mm -hmm. So, um, would yeah, is it not a bit more complicated than that because of the script of revolution? <laughs> well, fundamentally, yes, it's always a bit more complicated than that. <laughs> That's true. It always is. But, uh, so I agree. But I think the reason I said that was because, um, you know, there are people who are called, who call themselves revolutionaries and they form revolutionary networks and they plan a revolution and they often in great detail. Um, and this happens with great intensity in Paris. And there are several major insurrections, all of which fail, but 1832, 1834 and 1839, there are major uprisings in Paris. And um, they are produced by people we could call revolutionaries, um, Blanqui, Barbès, Martin Bernard, people like that. But um, the problem is that in 1848, it's fascinating actually to follow them through to 1848, a lot of them are in jail because they've already identified, made themselves visible to the authorities as, as seditious um, conspirers. And when they get liberated from jail, which they all do, <coughs> they find it impossible to get any kind of traction. You know, it's as if the revolution is running ahead of them, they can't catch up with it. And they end up being largely irrelevant to the events. I mean, Blanqui, you know, continues to fight for a revolutionary insurrection in a sort of Babaviste, you know, Robespierreist mode, but doesn't get anywhere with that. Um, and spends a large part of his life in jail. So, you know, 
I suppose the point I was making was that there are people planning a revolution, but they end up paradoxically being very remote from the causation of 1848 or from its management once it happens. Uh, they, f they fight to get into the picture and, and often don't, mostly don't succeed. Um, and so what that suggests is that the police, who had spent decades you know, crushing these sorts of uh, organizations and torturing their members and trying to extract information about who was part of them, who wasn't, and all this kind of thing, had been you know, preparing for the wrong revolution. And that what happened in 1848, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> was more like a kind of societal tsunami. What's interesting about 1848 is the sudden disinhibition of a very large part of urban society and the falling away of fear. And so it's not about, it isn't about revolutionary planning. And one of the interesting things about the events of the, those days when the beginnings of revolutions occur, and many contemporaries talk about this, is that there's an element of serendipity. This, it's almost as if they happen by chance. You know, in Palermo, it's the appearance of a poster saying, you know, in such and such a number of days, there will be a revolution. You know, arise Sicilian, Siciliani, you know, it says you, you, will be, you will be free, and so liberty is coming. Signed, Comitato Rivoluzionario, or the Revolutionary Committee. But of course, there is no Revolutionary Committee. The guy who wrote this poster was a guy called Bagnasco. It was a kind of prank. He thought, you know, if people believe this poster, maybe they'll come out into the streets, maybe there will be a revolution. And he was right. People came out into the streets. So, of course, did troops in double and triple strengths, because they had seen the poster as well. And the combustion occurred when crowds and troops bumped up against each other. And Lamartine commented on the opening events of the uh, February Revolution. He said, it was as if the revolution was engendered by the expectation and curiosity of the crowds which turned up to find out if a revolution was going to happen. <laughs> so there's an element of kind of self-combustion about these revolutions. They are precisely not planned. And that makes them in some ways much more interesting because it means that the revolutionary situation creates a radical vacuum. And people then have to think, you know, what do we do next? What is the next step after a revolution? In, in a place like Paris, this is a really difficult question because there's no one to tell you who will be the authority to answer this question. Who's going to form the government? Who's going to tell you who has the right to decide who will form the government? And the way this actually happens is incredibly serendipitous and sort of improvised. So I think you're right that this idea of revolution is in people's heads and that explains a lot of people's behavior. The script is there and so are the fears about how this thing could evolve. But that doesn't translate into planning. It's, it's, it's present as a form of historical awareness rather than in the form of a, a plan for action. It's not so different from today's flash mobs and how in the Netherlands the curfew riots uh, came about, um, social <coughs> media postings and then onto the street. Absolutely. Real, uh, real revolts. Yeah. Another rhyme. So, yeah. um, gentleman in the third row and then the gentleman there. Yeah, I, I have another problem. Uh, my problem is you Very didn't manage, uh, mention uh, Mr. Jefferson and the Constitution of America in your... Um, addressed to us, um, uh, with his dignity of man, he strikes a very important point of this revolution, I would say. And um, if you look at Saint-Just, uh, one of the worst uh, in the French Revolution, he says, um, to reach your goal, you have to terror, uh, you have to, to use terror, you have to take the possession of people, and you have to chase people who didn't, uh, who are afraid for liberty, chase through the door. Yes. Is that the question? And that, that, uh, that is the... Uh, the thing I wanted to... Mm. My English is not so good, sorry. No, uh, no absolutely, no, I mean, I, th I think that's interesting, but I, I think that, you know, people make quite arbitrary decisions about what is relevant about the past and what is not. And there was quite a lot of interest in the American Revolution among the 1848 revolutionaries, especially in Germany, where they reflected on whether a German republic couldn't 
they reflected on the possibility of a German president like the president of the United States. But the American Revolution did not have that kind of presence in, Europe, in the European imagination in 1848 that the French Revolution did. Um, because people you know, simply were part of a culture which had made sort of arbitrary decisions about what was relevant and what was not, I suppose. That would be my response. We will now take three questions and then perhaps the other panel members could respond to them as well. Gentlemen in the second row first. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you for uh, all of the uh, what you, what you do. I want to concentrate my, uh, on uh, the main question. Do democracy, democracies need a revolution? This that's question. And uh, I think, uh, I try to, uh, the time is, uh, the question is of if uh, the time is right for, uh, uh, for uh, such as uh, revolution in democracies, in democracies. And the, if yes, if the answer is, uh, answer is yes or no, is not, then we have to wait some more for that, that, that kind of a revolution and a fundament, fundamental uh, change, or uh, no, this is now uh, the time ripe, uh, ripe the time yes. ripe to, to yes. do something. And but I think uh, that uh, this is not uh, speaking about revolution uh, with violence and something like that in this time. But we have to make much more and as much as possible uh, uh, possibility for dialogue for so, so as, mo as yes, much as you. possible yeah. people. Thank you so much for that statement. That's an important statement, rather dialogue than bloodshedding. I think everyone will agree here. Um, gentlemen Thank in you. the fourth row, Stefano uh, Lissi. Yes, Stefano, yes. Yeah. Uh, and then the lady up there in the third row from above. Oh, thank you all for this wonderful keynotes and, and comments. Uh, my question was like for all of you. And uh, you mentioned that historicist perspectives were uh, a crucial cultural lens uh, through which uh, revolutionaries interpreted what was happening and also crafted possible future plans uh, between each other. Uh, mentioned 1789, but I can also think 1820, 1830. Uh, but the 19th century is also the era when, when many believe in the existence of, of national characters, uh, this inner feature shaped by like, climate, culture, et cetera, et cetera. So then I was interested to know whether these national stereotypes played a part in shaping plans for revolutions, and most importantly, in shaping transnational coordination plans between uh, the various revolutionaries groups. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Stefano. Um, OK, uh, my name is Emma. Thank you very much for the talk. Um, I was wondering, um, you said earlier that these revolutions cannot be considered a failure, but then also that the different revolutionary parties didn't agree with each other and didn't even look at how to find a common enemy or a common goal. Couldn't you say that because they didn't find any ground to move forward together, they failed? Good. Um, Glenda or Anneline, would you like to respond to any of the remarks made now? Um, Glenda, first. I feel that the expert in the room is Chris on these questions. <laughs> but I, do, I actually want to say that uh, in regard to the question on, on uh, the place of nationalism, I suppose it would be in, in the, um, 1848, and I think we should hear Chris on this, but what I really appreciate about the book, and, and you heard it in his lecture, I think, is um, the importance of understanding the European and even global scope of this you know, cascade of revolution and uh, its transnational dimensions and the importance, I suppose, of of countering a historiography that was always um, so focused on the, the national stories that have forgotten the European or even the global. So um, I really appreciated that aspect of the book, I have to say. 
Thank you, Glenda. This is a very valuable comment. Uh, Anneli? Um, well, um, I just keep on um, being triggered by this question. <laughs> uh, you know, to what extent the revolutions were a failure or not, and that obviously ties into the question to what extent we can ascribe intentions to mm -hmm. uh, groups of people that, uh, yes, had uh, disparate um, objectives. Um, yeah. And I have, I'm, I'm still not entirely convinced that, um, yeah, obviously these revolutionaries had, um, you know, um, you know, different intentions, and um, that makes their histories very complex. But um, I do agree, and I think that's a point raised by a helpful point raised by Devin, because they had this previous script uh, established in 1789. It was possible to, for them to think of themselves as wanting to be revolutionaries. Mm. Um, yeah, and I think we shouldn't overemphasize complexity either. Um, so I think, especially when you start comparing uh, 1848 in the French context to 1830, it's fairly obvious that the goals of the revolutionaries that end up being in charge in 1830 uh, were very different from the goals of the 1848 revolutionaries. Um, so in the yeah, I would yeah I I, I yeah I'm, I still think there's something to be said for the idea that they had a democratic goal and they failed in achieving uh, that goal. Mm. Should yes. I like to respond to Stefano's question, the question above, and yes. perhaps also to the dialogue? Absolutely, okay, uh, happy to do that. Um, first of all, starting with national, uh, national characteristics and the place of the national question, or the national questions of mid 19th century Europe in these revolutions. I mean, national struggles are everywhere in this, in this story. I mean, less so in France, but everywhere in Central Europe, they be, they're absolutely central. Um, and they have a, a you know, range, it's very difficult to generalize about the impact of national um, identities or national forms of mobilization, because on the one hand, they produce extraordinary phases of rapid mobilization and euphoria. They bring you know, peasants from all over Lombardy into, into you know, militias to fight the Austrians. People sacrifice their lives for some kind of imagined fatherland that doesn't yet exist. Um, you know, people fight and die for this idea. Um, so in that way, in that way, it can be a mobilizing sort of cohesion enforcing or cohesion reinforcing factor. But of course, it has more saliently the opposite effect um, of you know cutting revolutionary movements apart, forcing people to decide whether they want to act as a Rouman or a Manian speaker or as um, a liberal or radical. Right? If you're a radical um, and you live in uh, Bucharest, you know what view should you take of you know a, a possibly very uh, radical, but also, you know, in, in national and, and terms and eth ethnic terms, a chauvinistic Hungarian leadership. This is the same problem faced by Croatian and Serbian radicals. You know, very few of them are willing to make common cause with radicals of a nation which they see as imperiling the future of their own nation. So, nation nationality ends up being something that tears the revolution apart even faster than it puts you know, small-scale mobilizations together. And the national mobilizations turn out to be quite short-lived. You know, peasants flock to arms, but when they realize nothing much is happening, they very quickly desert again and go back to their farms. So these, you know, nationalism or national feeling has on the revolutions the effect of, of heroin on the life of a heroin, on the, on the body of a heroin addict. It produces extreme states of commitment and euphoria, and, you know, this is just amazing, man. But on the other hand, it also leads to a sort of loss of cohesion. Um, so it's, a, it's a, again, it's a complicated story. Um, you know, cohesion enhancing and cohesion, cohesion undermining at the same time. I think the question about why, why can't we call it a failure if they, if they fail to agree? I suppose, I mean, I, I see the force of that question, I really do. And I suppose part of my problem is I have to sort of be open about this, is that I've never liked the kind of history which is sort of finger pointing and saying, you failed. And I think one of the problems, you know, the sort of, it's, it's you know, there's a, pro a program called The Apprentice you know, where, which Donald Trump did in the United States and someone called Alan Sugar did it in London, where you're fired, right? Um, you failed, you're fired. And because, of course, the presumption there is that there's an instance, a sort of an authority, standing outside the historical process who's acting as a kind of judge over all times and saying, you know, you did well, you did badly. And I've always thought, you know, it's good to be moral, to write moral history, a history which is moral, which is infused with moral... 
uh, a moral awareness. But not, I've always been a bit skeptical about moralizing history. So I suppose I just have to confess to a temperamental difficulty with the idea of failure. I mean, obviously, as I said, as I conceded to Anneline, there, there are clearly our failures. People fail to get what they want, and they fail sometimes even to follow through themselves with, with their own programs. And they fail to listen to each other. But on the other hand, you could say, well, is it reasonable to expect radicals in a situation like that, where the relationship between radicals and liberals was competitive? You know, do, do, do rivals listen to each other when they're competing for the same terrain? You know, enemies often are deaf to each other's arguments. And that's a, a feature of politics, which is regrettable, but also very widely observed. And so I suppose we could say that this failure is, you know, often present in our political processes. And that's why I think, you know, Although it sounds a bit, you know, aunt, what's the expression of Aunt Sallyish? I think is probably not not a very good term these days. But you know, it sounds a bit sort of um, plangent and and sentimental to say that people ought to listen to each other. It's a bit banal. But I mean, the fact is, I remember once sitting at a there was a prize giving for Joachim Gauck, um, the the former German president, and I was sit, sitting at a table, and there were a bunch of um, ministers there from the then German West German government, the German, you know government of the German Federal Republic. And I asked them, there was the justice minister was there and the Ministry of the Interior and so on. And I said, so do you guys go online and, you know, look at the, the websites of the AFD and, and Die Linke, you know, the far left and, and the far right? And they went, no, why? Why should we? And I said, well, you might learn something by looking at what these people are saying. I said, no, they're all crazy. And I thought, this is not good. This is not a good sign. That, you know, we should be listening to all the voices and, uh, you know, trying to find bridges between different positions. And, you know, it's easy to say that and very hard to do. But keeping on trying to do it is a good posture, it seems to me, in politics. And simply abandoning that, which clearly they had done, and Gizor did as well. Said, I'm not going to listen to these crazies. You know, we've got the system working. That's always a mistake. Thank you. The last question is for Kees here. Sorry, I didn't realise mine was going to be the last. Um, I have to apologise, first of all, for not having read the book yet. I'm saving it up for rather a long holiday. Um, I have, however, read The Sleepwalkers, uh, which the way that you were presenting this talk, it, it triggered the question in me how these books are in one way connected as kind of exercises in a certain type of history, right? Yeah. In both cases, there seems to be um, an effort there to, to liberate personal histories, but also the histories of contingency from historical processes that have often been sort of inscribed with a certain mechanical nature to them, right? The, the power keg in the Balkans, the, the domino theory that spreads across Europe. And I wonder, and perhaps that might actually make it night that's a good final question. How these two big books kind of illustrate your approach to history? Like, is there a historiographical manifesto here? Have you created an oeuvre yet? <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, that's interesting. There's always the danger if one ponders on this, or uh, that one will start giving away one's secret, and that one, in the end, <laughs> that what the Germans call die Masche, you know, the underlying kind of technique will become clear, and everyone see, will see, oh, he just does the same thing every time, right? Um, well, um, I think, you know, um, but it's a really interesting question. It's not one I've actually thought about very much, but I think one dimension of an, any honest answer would have to be that, you know, I am interested in complexity, and the effects that complexity has on the actors who are operating in complex situations because I think it does have interesting effects when the situation is illegible hard to predict um, and not very transparent and people don't know where decision-making is happening for example that was one of the key interests that I that I, I developed in, in, in thinking about it 1914 was that nobody knew what the others really were intending to do and the question you know, who's really in charge in Berlin who's really in charge in st. Petersburg Paris Vienna and so on um, was right at the center so illegible complex systems made uh, them were themselves a factor in how individuals behaved they increased the sense of risk they increased also in some cases the willingness to take risks because people felt you know it's going to get even worse very soon if we don't act fast that kind of thing so i was interested in the the effects of complexity on the people who are operating in complex situations um, and the other thing is and that comes back to my uh, the discussion we i had with the questioner from up here namely that 
I, you know, I've always been a bit skeptical to, uh, or about or slightly allergic to very moralizing accounts. And I grew up in, 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 as a school child and so on. In Australia, of course, 1914 was a central theme because Australians fought in considerable numbers for a very small nat nation at that time, um, not around the world, actually, in the Middle East and, and Mesopotamia and you name it, but also on the fields of France and so on, and Flanders, um, <clears throat> and died in considerable numbers. And so we did study that, uh, that war, and what we were taught at school was that, you know, there were lots of good guys, the Russians were just quietly going about their business, and good old Britain was just trying to keep the peace, and the French were, you know, uh, uh, sipping a cup of coffee and having a croissant in the morning, and, and then into this, you know, t pleasant scene burst a sort of psychopathic maniac in the form of Germany and just started a war for, you know, and so on. And I just remember thinking, is this really the way history happens? Is you know, um, and it, the, the sort of psychopath in the park thesis seemed to me just, and that was the way it was taught to us, you know. Um, and I remember the teacher saying, when you're answering a question on the outbreak of the First World War, remember the five German provocations, right? And we just listened, you know, ships. You shouldn't build ships because that makes the British upset. You know, Morocco, you shouldn't challenge the French in Morocco, that makes the French upset. You shouldn't help the Austrians in the Balkans, that upsets the Russians, and so on. On it went. And, you know, I just thought, can then, is there not a way of thinking about this, which is not about, you know, why did the war break out because someone made it break out, but rather, how did peace become war? And what are the many paths you have to walk in order to understand how a situation of peace becomes a situation of the most horrific war and cruelty and destruction? And that was what interested me. Uh, and I thought the answer can't be because the Germans decide to start one. And when I looked into this from a sort of how point of view, it, it seemed to me less and less tenable, that way of thinking about it. So I suppose the connection with 1848 is that, you know, I've read lots of, there are lots of wonderful books about 1848. But one thing it's quite a few of them, not all of them actually, but quite a few of them have in common, is that they pick a horse in the race. And they say, these are the real revolutionaries. Everybody else is a counter-revolutionary or a bastard or whatever. And, you know, um, and, and the real revolutionaries are usually the, the, the radicals because the radical program is effectively the world we live in today. We, uh, democracy, I mean, this is interesting, important to remember that they didn't want anything that we don't already enjoy now. They wanted, you know, and in fact, we enjoy more because we have, we've enfranchised the women, which the radicals didn't want. But they did want, you know, a mass democracy and all this kind of thing. And they wanted a welfare state or, or the elements of a welfare state and so on. That's all been achieved. So we look at them and we say, they're our people. That's us in the past. Let's see how they fare. And we find that they failed but, or that they were thwarted by others. But in fact, it seemed to me more interesting to, to try and adopt a multiple politics, where you try and think about what everybody's after, what everybody's trying to achieve. And then you end up with this multiplicity of intentions, um, which is in some ways it's a less linear um, story and one which is less, lends itself less to a clear moral uh, inference. But on the other hand, I think is in some way, I, I hope anyway, is in some ways more instructive or uh, more generative of insight anyway for, a contemporary, for our contemporary condition. Not of lessons, but, but one hopes, or at least I hope, modestly, of insight. So that would be my answer. I think that is the connection. Thank you so much for that brilliant last question, Kees, and even more so for the brilliant participations, your keynote, your reflection. Uh, Glenda, thank you for uh, staying tuned with us. And what I really liked, what we learned today, is amongst lots of other things, is that complexity also is very tangible, that, that, that it has a sensation with it and it has even a morality with it. That's very important to, to bring home. And if you're all finished with the revolution, I would like to thank you, Anneline, and you can go home and drink tea with this little gift. And uh, you too, Chris. Oh, good. Thank you so much. Quit the revolution, go home and drink tea. Glenda, yours will uh, uh, be arriving over post uh, in the next weeks. <laughs> and thank you so much, all of you, for participating. And there's drinks outside. So thank you. And give me a warm applause, please, for Chris and Thank you very much. Thank you.